Good evening. My name is Alessandra Moctezuma and I'm the gallery director here at Mesa College and I also run the museum studies program and I want to welcome you to uh, our artist talk tonight, Jeffrey Clark, and thank you so much for also coming to the opening this evening and the reception. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank uh, all the students in museum studies that helped us put together the exhibit. And they've been doing a lot of hard work. You know, they learned how to do all the, everything from the lighting to hanging the show, and they've been working gallery sitting and doing all that. So I wanted to thank them uh, because even though it's a requirement, they still appreciate it. <laughs> And uh, also, Pat Vine never gets to come over here for the talks because she's down there keeping the gallery open. But I wanted to to thank her for all her help too, and uh, and all the other faculty who support us too. Um, so tonight uh, we uh, have artist Jeffrey Clark, and um, I guess most of you might have had a chance to see his work. Uh, he's a painter and has developed a very unique style of working, uh, in a sense, creating a three-dimensionality by working in layers of acrylic. And um, I was really uh, intrigued by his work, uh, also in that he brings into it uh, abstraction of uh, shapes that seem to de be derived from <coughs> organic sources. Some of them uh, look like uh, microscopic close-ups, um, some of them uh, evoke birds, some of them seem uh, underwater scenes. So I was very drawn to that and also because besides dealing with abstraction there's also a surreal element in the way that he creates environments within which these shapes uh, seem to float. And he'll tell you more in detail about, about his work. Um, I. Um, became aware of his work about three years, three or four years ago, and besides doing these types of surreal abstract uh, pieces, he also has some figurative work, uh, in case you guys are interested in asking him about that series you know, too. Uh, but I wanted this to, to show more the abstract portion because it came after a show of Gloria Torres, which was more of a narrative uh, figurative, childlike pieces, so I thought this would be a very interesting contrast to that. Um, and um, I hope that the students have a lot of good questions for him. Uh, Jeffrey Clark studied in Seattle, where he got his degree in art. Uh, one of his uh, teachers was artist uh, Jacob Lawrence, and um, he's exhibited his work here in San Diego also, <laughs> Uh, it is in collections in Seattle and traveled in Japan. Uh, so uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Alessandra for showing my work and uh, putting the whole show together and everything. Pat Vine's been really wonderful help uh, and giving me some good ideas on how to, to make the installation work with the rest of the show and how to describe my work in words uh, to help people understand it in a briefer kind of form. Uh, I brought some slides to show. I didn't bring a lot of slides, uh, but I brought some slides mainly of things I was doing uh, right before the pieces that are in the show. And so most of it's fairly abstract. I, I was also doing some more representational work. Uh, you can see that in a, a couple of the slides I brought. And uh, I'd also like to thank my wife, Hiroko, uh, for uh, helping me, uh, supporting me. She helped me also make the installation piece. Uh, and for people wondering, you know, where I'm from and about some of my background, I'm from uh, the Northwest. Uh, and a lot of people will notice, like, sort of the interest in biology and nature, which I've always <coughs> been interested in. When when I started school, I thought at the time that I was going to be a marine biologist. I think I'd seen too many uh, episodes of Jacques Cousteau in my youth, probably, and. Uh, in the course of uh, going to school at the University of Washington. I got a little burned out on all the uh, prerequisite courses that were rather dry and I ended up 
getting into taking writing classes and studying art later on and sort of at, at a certain point became just interested in exploring you know, the imagination in, in terms of art and and so I ended up getting a BFA uh, from the art school there and their orientation really was uh, pretty pretty much geared to abstract expressionism was probably the dominant uh, mode of thinking at that time but uh, Jacob Lawrence was still there and he, he was a real uh, terrific uh, figurative painter who chronicled the history of uh, black people in America and his style is really very unique uh, and uh, probably the thing that uh, influenced my work the most after I, I got out of school was going to Europe. Uh, where I, I traveled for about three and a half months and I went to Spain for about a month of that. Uh, made it to Italy and Greece, France, uh, Switzerland, Portugal and in the process of doing that you, you find that people from different com countries look at things completely differently and that you, you learn you had all these ideas that you taken for granted that are really open to question and uh, that was really uh, an interesting experience to me and uh, a great time also. Uh, I think I learned more about art uh, by going to Europe and and spending time standing in front of all these you know great works of art that you've read about and heard about and, and trying to figure out how the artist made them and what it felt like to make them and all those kind of things. Uh, and Probably the, to give an example of something that really influenced me that I saw would probably be the work of El Greco. Uh, he's probably my favorite figurative artist. Uh, the sense of fluid movement in his work and uh, there's a, a mastery of composition that, that he had that is really something outstanding that I've always been interested in and, and his work has a sense of mystery to it that you know, with a really strong work of art, you can come back to it and keep finding new things. And it's not something you just look at a few times and, okay, I get it. And then you lose interest in it. His work has that kind of mystery that uh, that uh, keeps someone really interested. And uh, so he's probably the... the person who influenced me, you know, the most of what I saw in my travels. Then uh, returning back to Seattle uh, after having gone to Europe, uh, I went through a little period of depression when you have to adjust to the boredom and workaday world again, of course, after uh, being uh, so interested in, in everything you're seeing. Uh, but uh, after getting back, I did uh, get into doing some uh, volunteer work for the Henry Gallery, which is connected to the university there, and I worked on a couple of installations for Anne Hamilton and James Terrell, who were two really terrific, top-notch uh, installation artists. Uh, there aren't too many more exciting uh, people than those two uh, who are working in the United States. Uh, and that kind of gave me the inspiration to want to do something with installation at some point. Uh, you know, the piece I have in this show is certainly a lot more modest than anything they do. They do a lot of things that are very large scale, involve uh, quite a, a force of, of volunteer people that, that help them make their pieces. Uh, and let's see, uh, maybe at this point I'll, I'll get to showing some of the slides here. Uh, so these uh, these first pieces are, are examples of what I was doing before I started working on acrylic sheet and doing uh, the layered thing that uh, a lot of uh, the pieces in this show uh, are represented by. Uh, in 97 I was doing these pieces which are they're about three by seven feet roughly. They were painted on hollow core doors and so they you know, relate to the size of your body and I, I wanted to to uh, suggest a kind of space, uh, an imaginary space that you could almost imagine walking into. Uh, this first one is called uh, The Flame and uh, this I think 
shows also that I've, I'm very interested in working with visual metaphor. Uh, words have a specificity, they have a definite meaning, but when you're dealing with images, they have an inherent ambiguity. There's a, a range of associations that images can suggest, and I like to embrace uh, an open-ended quality uh, there. In, in terms of meaning, uh, images, you know, suggest a wider range of, of interpretation. I think, uh, you know, a flame represents things like uh, transformation, uh, the spark of life, uh, passion. Uh, there are all kinds of things that a symbol like that stands for, and in a lot of pieces I like to to try to invoke more than just one association. And I think the Surrealists were interested in that kind of open-ended uh, approach to things, and, and I feel sort of attracted to what the Surrealists and the Dadaist people were, were doing, uh, partly for that reason, and also because of uh, the kind of formal experimenting they did with how to make images. Uh, how to apply paint different ways uh, to take advantage of happy accidents and get things to happen that aren't uh, planned. Uh, you know, their work wasn't wasn't rational. It involved more intuition uh, than the work of someone who's trying to represent specifically a scene that they're looking at. Uh, you know, I'm interested in in giving form to something that's imagined rather than representing uh, or imitating what you see with the eye. Uh, and in this piece too, uh, you know, it was one of the first pieces where I started to get really interested in making things float, uh, which is you know, these shapes that, that are uh, floating, which later on, of course, took a different form in uh, the acrylic pieces that I'm doing there. And this one is titled uh, Distant Shore. Some of the stuff I do has a kind of science fiction, maybe, quality to it. Uh, and uh, I've done a few pieces that suggest musical instruments or, the, or kind of a connection to the idea of music, which I think this piece has going on a little bit also. Uh, And this next one is called Biogenesis, more of a biology kind of oriented thing you know, about the proliferation of life. And you know, these, these pieces are all like about three by seven feet, something like that, roughly. Uh, and yeah, this one has you know, a suggestion of the, the oceanic kind of environment that I'm interested in. And you can also see in the upper corner there uh, uh, some things that suggest microscopic life, uh, which I, I wanted to uh, give the sense in some of those pieces that I have in this show of looking through a microscope and and when you do that you can see through these microscopic organisms to a certain degree usually. Uh, my, my grandfather was a doctor and so I have his uh, microscope which I like to look through occasionally and, and so that's going to uh, give me some ideas about, about, you know, working with that medium of, of acrylic sheet and so on. As I said, I've, I've also done more uh, work that, some of it on acrylic sheet, some of it uh, on wood uh, is probably the thing I like to work with uh, primarily in addition to the acrylic sheet. Uh, there are things that are figurative and more representational. This one, uh, you know, the figure is more identifiable and it's thinking about the connection of people to their environment and about the, the idea of uh, wilderness being something that exists inside people's heads as well as uh, out there, uh, you know, the idea of wilderness being a place of freedom, etc., etc. Uh, and this piece is probably uh, like 36 by 48, something like that. Uh, this is from uh, 
1998, I think, uh, and, and yeah, the other bigger pieces were all from 97. This next piece is something that I did, uh, well, at the time I was working as an installer for a lot of the art museums around town, for the Natural History Museum, some of the museums in Balboa Park, and I'd done some work for uh, the Fleet uh, Space Theater, and they they had this exhibit where they uh, had a, a computer that was hooked up to the Pacific Bell Weather Net station and downloaded weather data, and so they wanted someone to do a mural that showed different types of clouds and weather conditions. So I I did this uh, painting for them. It was up for about a year and a half, I think. Uh, back in let's see, I did this in the 2000, I think it was, and. Uh, it's about uh, 16 feet by 8 feet wide, and with a, the alcove is something like 3 feet deep or so. And I also snuck in a few uh, hidden images and some of the clouds uh, for the entertainment of some of the employees in the museum there. I think I had God with a telephone receiver to his ear, uh, you know, talking to people below, uh, hidden in the clouds there just for, for uh, fun and some other uh, silly uh, joke images kind of hidden away in there. Uh, I've, I like to work with different media and so I've done some pieces where well, I've, I did a series of figurative uh, pastels back in the earlier oh, 90s and uh, I've done pieces where I like to combine watercolor and pastel and play those two different mediums off each other which is what this one does. Uh, it's probably uh, you know ten by fourteen inches or so. Uh, this is from like about uh, two thousand at, at the same sort of time period that I was doing the the acrylic paintings, and you know you can see you know the abstracted idea of a head there, but kind of blown up into some weird abstract uh, shape. And that's another one that involves the same sort of medium uh, approach, uh, pastel and watercolor and combination. Uh, same, same time period there. But that was one of the uh, more representational uh, acrylic uh, pieces that has a mirror in, involved in it also. Uh, and uh, I went back and forth between doing some that were representational and some that were abstract. And I really started off doing the abstract pieces uh, first, but uh, you know, this is an example of some of the others. And uh, then this is the last slide. Uh, this one was from uh, 1998, so it was one of the first ones that I did. It was a larger piece. It's probably about 36 by 48 or so. Again, I was sort of thinking of music underwater, uh, a musical kind of connection in that one. Uh, and I showed that, uh, well, I, I first showed these uh, acrylic pieces. Uh, in, I showed a few of them in 98 in, in Art Walk, which wasn't a big event then that it is now, but I still got a lot of people that came through and looked at the work I had up, which also included uh, those door pieces. Then uh, in 99, I started showing uh, some of these up at uh, Escondido Arts Partnership. Uh, up in Escondido, they do juried uh, shows up there. I uh, showed some of them at the Art Institute, and well, I showed one in 2000, and showed some on Ray Street in you know, 2002. There was a gallery, back then it was called Trey Gallery, and uh, I showed, showed a few of these pieces uh, then. I think now it's called Andrea Rushing, and I, I tried to get a little cooperative gallery thing going in the Ray Street area also. I did a did a show there in a space and uh, ended up not being able to get enough people interested in trying to get something going, which I couldn't really do by myself. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting experience anyway, and a lot of people saw that show and the show that I'd done earlier at Trey, uh, which I showed a lot of these acrylic pieces in, which uh, maybe to describe some of those little 8 by 10 pieces uh, to a little greater degree, which uh, I'll just leave it on this one since it's right side up here. Uh, 
Uh, with those little pieces, I was uh, thinking about drawing the viewer in. You know, I, I respond to, to size to a certain degree. When you work on a big piece, it has uh, has one quality that is expansive that suggests maybe landscape or a space that you know you can inhabit. Whereas a really small piece becomes something that's can be secretive or draw the viewer in, be mysterious. Uh, and I was interested in in dealing with the idea of uh, identity of, of of heads that are abstracted, but um, you know someone's personality is is conveyed by abstract means and by layers of of pain instead of by uh, by you know, what we're used to seeing in terms of uh, facial features and so on. And uh, I use the mirrors to to reflect the viewer's eyes, uh, to make the viewer aware of the uh, the act of looking. Uh, and and the different layers of, of paint uh, also. One layer covers up something else that's painted below it, so there are parts of the painting that are uh, not seen, but you're aware that they're they're there, which is another uh, thing I was kind of thinking about in, in making these and thinking about uh, the aspects of personality that aren't aren't seen, aren't visible, of course. Uh, and uh, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to say there. If uh, anyone has any questions, I'll answer some questions here. Um, I noticed with a lot of your pieces, um, they're all very symmetrical. Like, is that something you did, um, like, consciously, or is it just you're drawn to symmetrical shapes? And uh, the symmetrical, yeah, the uh, symmetrical pieces, uh, well, since I was interested in biology, one of the characteristics of higher life forms is that they're symmetrical. So if you want to imagine some sort of weird life form, that's a characteristic that a higher life form would have. Uh, that's one reason. Uh, the other reason is uh, a lot of them are intended to suggest heads or bodies, and those are both symmetrical forms. Uh, so that's really the main, those are the two main reasons for, for doing things that are symmetrical. Uh -huh. um, I noticed downstairs in large paintings that you did, um, when you did drapery or something similar to drapery, it looked like it was almost uh, spray painted rather than using a brush. Uh, a brush no, it was brushed, uh, it was scumbled. Uh, you take most of the paint off the brush, dry it off so there's very little paint on it, and uh, that way you leave just a little bit of paint and you can get it looking smooth like that. Uh, you know, I wanted to to make make it look soft and suggest you know water or atmospheric space, and to a certain degree, not not make it seem really sculptural. I didn't want it a real hard edge, the hard sculptural kind of feel to it. So, yeah. uh -huh. uh, in some of your work, you use a calcium carbonate. Uh, why do you use that? Uh, I, I like to make paint to different things. You know, you thin it down. Uh, if you're working with acrylic, you put water in it, you can make it run. Uh, I like to get real textural qualities in, in some of the surfaces. Uh, this one doesn't really have that going in it. But uh, yeah, I, I mix things like that to make the paint uh, thicker so that when you use a palette knife or do something textural, it, it holds texture and, and just has a real different look and feel. I like to play different paint surfaces off one another. Um, how, how do you do, when you're doing the layered pieces, do you uh -huh. uh, in terms of how working with the paint and how do, you, how do you prepare the paint, or how do you, so that it adheres to the, because plexiglass is, I mean, you could easily scratch it off, or? Uh-huh. Uh, well, acrylic, yeah, doesn't it adhere? I, I found that the oil paint seems to adhere better to acrylic, probably, than acrylic paint does, but 
if you put uh, what I do is I put varnish over it, which helps uh, helps it to adhere to the surface. Put a couple layers on, and uh, that seems to help a lot. Uh -huh. When you're doing it, do you um, like you paint one layer? And then you, do you go on to the next layer and then put them together? Or do you have the idea of it all together? Uh, each layer? You know, usually I start with some sketches and it always ends up, it usually ends up changing. You know, you start with a certain composition in mind, start with a back layer, work forward, and then, you know, you can take the back one and put it in front of the others and sometimes they work backwards. So, you know, until they're all put together, you can work in a different order and I'm not always I'm just going in one direction or anything. Yeah. And I have another question. On one of them, it looked almost like the painted and baked, there were little holes. You know, like, um, almost like pottery. Oh, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was the one she asked about, I think, probably, where I listed calcium carbonate as, yeah, you know, you mix something in with a paint to stiffen it up, and then when you do something like that to it, it holds whatever texture you, you want to apply to it, uh, which is what I was doing in that one. What's my next series? Uh, well, uh, right now, after doing this show, I find myself wanting to do uh, more abstract. Well, I want to do some some larger things again. You know, a larger size. Uh, get some more of the abstract uh, ideas going that suggest atmospheric space. Uh, I'd like to do more installation work, also. Uh, definitely. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Is there a certain reason why you find biology so interesting? What's like the main focus in that? Uh, I don't know. How do I explain that? I don't know. Or? Just a sense of curiosity. Uh, I think to a certain degree art is about keeping the sense of wonder alive in people and uh, a lot of people lose that uh, as they get older. But, you know, I want to just try to keep that alive uh, in myself and, you know, hopefully uh, the viewer gets something out of that when they're looking at your work. Uh, what most influenced me? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, you know, I really love his work. He's, uh, he's a brilliant draftsman, uh, like Michelangelo. He exaggerated uh, form for its expressive possibilities uh, in terms of composition. You know, he was really brilliant. In one of his paintings, he called the Esfolio, it shows Christ in a, a red robe and there are all these soldiers in the painting who are holding spears and the spears create a focal point that's actually outside of the painting, uh, which is a really unconventional uh, compositional idea. And the, the red of, the, of Christ's robe keeps your eye from just going completely out of the painting. But So his, his sense of composition is uh, ability to communicate, uh, you know, uh, mental, spiritual qualities in his work that give it a, a mystery that's, you know, like I say, is, is difficult to get to the bottom tip of uh, his, he was quite, quite a draftsman, portrait painter, uh, quite a paint handler, you know, all those things, uh, I think, are what really attract me in his work. Uh -huh. In regards to biology, when you paint an organism, are you working from a specific true life organism, um, or are you just creating your own? Uh, everything in this show uh, is imagined. There's nothing that's real. They're all imagined. Uh, but like I say, I have done also a lot of work that has the same form on, on the acrylic sheet that that is uh, representational and does uh, show, you know, things that are, are real and approaches, you know, a more realistic attitude towards things. But not a, not in the work in this particular show. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Well, there was a piece in the gallery, um, I don't, it was to the left of your larger blanket or fabric piece. It's, yeah. Um, it, your canvas painting, um, it was like wind, sunshine and wind or something like that. Oh, uh-huh. Um, what was your inspiration for that particular piece? Uh, well, 
<clears throat> I mean, a lot of the work, uh, that's something I've always been interested in, in is the transitory nature of things. You know, I mentioned that in the, when I first started doing those doors, I wanted to make things float. Well, the things that are floating are in a position of instability. I mean, something's moving through the air, or something's in the process of changing. Uh, uh, nothing in life is static. It's always in motion. It's always changing. Uh, that idea of the transients uh, is interesting to me and something I'm constantly, uh, you know, showing in my work. And that that piece was, you know, about the idea of the interaction of atmosphere wearing away rock in the deserts, and, and that's kind of the idea, basically, wind wearing away at rock and so on. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I uh, really appreciate it.